begin just by thanking Shelley for her involvement in um, being here all day today and working to get information about VegFest on the radio this week. Um, it's been my pleasure. Can you hear me in the back? Okay, wonderful. So um, I'm going to grab a clicker and I'm going to stand over here so I'm not blocking anything. And um, my topic today, so we're going to talk about diabetes, um, my favorite topic, because I learned in nursing school that this is a lifelong disease. Once people get it, they're always going to have it. My job is to help people manage it. And I took great pride in helping people get on insulin early, because I thought I was doing them a favor, and um, figure out you know, how to fit diabetes fit their life to diabetes, not fit diabetes, or fit diabetes to life. Anyway, now I'm, enlightened. I'm an enlightened practitioner, and I'm really happy to share with you um, some of the lessons that I've learned along the way. So my topic today is diabetes 2020. Um, you know, where are we now, where are we going? And I called it less farm, P-H-A-R-M, more farm. And um, as Shelly mentioned, I'm with the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, which is a nonprofit based in Washington, D.C. It's an organization I'm really proud to work for. I've been with them for 12 years now. I'm the Director of Diabetes Education and Care, so I'm involved in public and professional education along with efforts around um, clinical research and advocacy. We're up on the Hill teaching legislators about um, the school lunch program and the farm bill and we're also working to get animals out of medical education and out of um, testing where we do, you know, we've had drugs come on the market for diabetes that are safe in animals, but then we find out after thousands, millions of people have taken them that they don't work so well or they're not safe in people. So the Physicians Committee works to move towards human models and not animal models for testing. So let's see. Um, all right. So. Um, today we're going to talk about the messages I want you to take home is that diabetes pre is preventable, treatable, and reversible. The best medication, you already have an idea about this, does not come from the pharmacy. And what are some steps that you can take to turn diabetes around? My former patients make me hopeful. So I want to introduce you to Ira, who's graciously allowed me to share his story. Um, when Ira, Ira at his worst was on over 200 units of insulin a day, four injections a day. Um, he had high blood pressure, high cholesterol, depression, lots of medical problems. This is a more recent picture of Ira. And he had just completed his first half Ironman. I will tell you who you applauded for. Um, he's now completed two full Ironman. That means it's a full marathon run, a 112-mile bike ride, and a 2.2-mile swim all in one day. So that is the power of plants. <laughs> so this is a message of hope. Diabetes, you know, I always I learned it was a really depressing disease, and it is. I mean, it can be. It causes all kinds of complications, problems, um, for people, but today's story is really about hope with this disease. So I think it's best illustrated by looking at diabetes among Native Americans. And in my work with the Physicians Committee, I've had the privilege for the last 11 years now of working with Native Americans, um, especially the Navajo people. So I want to tell you a little bit about the story of uh, diabetes um, among Native Americans. And I'm going to switch to this side for this. So first of all, you know that diabetes can affect people from head to toe. When there's too much sugar in the blood, um, it damages the blood vessels it goes to and the organs. And that's why we see people with diabetes are more likely to have heart attacks or strokes, kidney failure, loss of vision, um, amputations, nerve damage, even dementia. And certain types of cancer are linked to uncontrolled diabetes. And this is a picture of a woman on a dialysis machine. Um, and that's when kidneys fail. This is the only, well, this and kidney transplant are the only treatments that we have available, but they're not a cure. Um, 
So Native Americans have been especially hard hit with diabetes, um, but um, the Navajo tribe um, has among the highest rate, and I've circled the areas of New Mexico and Arizona and a little bit of Utah where the tribe is located, and this map, the darker the color, the higher the rates of diabetes. Now across the U.S., diabetes is about 10%, I think, of the population now, but among Native Americans, it's 16%, and some tribes even higher. And it's estimated among the Navajo people um, to have rates of 35% of all adults have type 2 diabetes. And the tribe is 350,000 people. So this is a picture of a billboard as you're coming into Window Rock, Arizona. And Window Rock is like the Washington, D.C. of the Navajo Nation. And it's a rural area. There's about 4,000 um, residents there. And of course, McDonald's has found its way there. One of the reasons we have such an epidemic of diabetes, and people, when I ask, you know, why do you think Native Americans are so hard hit, people will say, well, you know, alcoholism or um, depression or poverty, and absolutely those, those are factors. Um, but the U.S. government has actually contributed quite a bit to this epidemic among Native Americans because we've provided commodity boxes of food. And among the Navajo, about 50% of the population below the poverty line and they are eligible for these boxes of food. Now, they do include some fresh fruits and vegetables, but they also include canned meat and blocks of cheese, which the Navajo, by the way, refer to as Navajo gold. This is a, a really popular food. and You know, it's high in fat, it tastes good, it, it, it's kind of addictive. And then um, powdered milk is another food that is given to Native Americans. When you think about it, how crazy is that? You know, Native Americans were never chasing down buffalo and milking them <laughs> to drink milk. <laughs> so that we would think that they would need milk. And about 75% or more of Native Americans are lactose intolerant, which is not a disease. It's a perfectly normal way of, you know, we're the only species on the planet that drinks milk after infancy. We certainly don't need it. Lard was included in the commodity box until about eight years ago. So I mean, you can imagine that this is not healthy food. Spam is not provided by the government, but it's very popular. We've gotten Native Americans hooked on these canned meats, and I wasn't aware of the variety of canned meats that were available. Um, but there are all different flavors. And what's really interesting to me about this is that a single can of Spam, if you turn it over and look at the label, it's supposed to serve six people. But it's often consumed by one person or sometimes shared by two people. And it's 96 grams of fat in a serving of Spam. So it's a horrible food for people who are at risk of diabetes. Um, not because it's high in carbohydrate, but because it's high in fat. And that is a message I'm going to be giving you over and over today about food and diabetes. So what did Native Americans eat? Well, they would eat um, corn, beans, and squash. And those are foods that are known as the Three Sisters. And they're called the Three Sisters because these are foods that grow well together. The corn grows up, and the beans use the corn as a pole, and then the squash covers the soil in big leaves and shades the soil and prevents weeds from growing. So they grow together beautifully and they taste delicious together, right? But many Native Americans have gotten away from their traditions of farming. So the Physicians Committee was invited to come and do an educational program. And we, um, we went to learn, I went with Dr. Barnard um, to learn about what their traditional foods were and what people were eating now, and they wanted to learn from us. And we had a really nice conversation and they invited us back to do some classes. So here, um, this is me in the middle there next to Chef Walter Whitewater, and we're teaching, and then there's Dr. Neil Barnard next to us, right in the very middle. Um, and we are teaching a group of health educators on the Navajo Nation about plant-based eating. And I always smile when I, I think of this first meeting because I was in a room with eight Navajo educators, and we were talking about 
what are we going to call this way of eating? And you know, this was 10 years ago. So at the time, our research was, we called it a vegan diet. And they said, well, you can't use vegan. You know, that's a white, yuppie word. And uh, we said, okay, how about plant-based? And they said, well, plant-based in the Navajo or the Diné language, we don't have a word for plant-based. It would translate as weeds. We didn't want to call it the weeds diet. So we kind of went around and around with that. So we ended up with um, calling our program Food for Life, Native Food for Life. But at the end of those first eight weeks, they were all talking about eating vegan. So it was sort of funny to see that evolution. Um, so I'll just introduce you to a couple of people. This is Marjolene, and she is a nutritionist with the Navajo Nation. And Marjolene was worked for the worked in her job teaching about nutrition for 10 years. And she felt like she knew everything. And then she got diagnosed with diabetes. And she was put on one pill and then a second pill. And she was coming to our classes and she, you know, she'd laugh, she'd make all of us laugh. She's really funny. Um, and after a year or so, she decided she was going to start eating a plant-based diet. And she didn't tell me she'd had diabetes. But I saw her 10 weeks after she started, and she'd lost 8 pounds. And she was feeling great. And she stuck with it. And now she's lost like six dress sizes. And she's off all of her diabetes medications, her blood pressure medications. And in her job, she covers a huge a geographical area. She has to get in and out of her car. She's sitting in her car for a long time. And she gets stiff and achy. But when she changed her diet, she didn't feel like that anymore. And she's 65 years old. So, you know, this was a remarkable change for her. And she's now teaching people on the Navajo Nation. So I'm going to skip through some of these others because I have so much to tell you about. But just, this is a picture on the right side, that is, or the left for you. Um, this is the a power plate that was developed by the Physicians Committee. And these are the four food groups that we recommend. Fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes, like beans and peas and lentils. And the Navajo nutritionists took it and they made what they call the Diné power plate, which has the same four food groups. And this is what they're now teaching. And in 2015, the then president of the Navajo Nation, uh, President Begay, passed a resolution encouraging all Navajo people to get more exercise, and to eat a plant-based diet. Woo! Yeah, so I'm really excited to see that. So our work there has continued. We now have done trainings in two hospitals, teaching the cooks how to make plant-based meals. So there are hospitals on the Navajo Nation where anybody can go into the cafeteria and get a plant-based meal. Um, here's the cooks eating, some with more enthusiasm than others. <laughs> Oops. And then this is all of the staff at Sohoso Medical Center in Fort Defiance. And we also have Gallup Indian Medical Center now. They're the largest hospital on the Navajo Nation. They serve people all over the um, Navajo Nation, um, 100 bed hospital. So this is a picture of me with four of the nutritionists. And we're showing that at, one, at the grocery store in Window Rock, you can get non-dairy milk. Um, and unfortunately, you can see in the background, there's still cow's milk available but they're working to change that. And then another tribe, the Taona Odom in um, Arizona, have a really creative use for their powdered milk that they're receiving from the government. They're using it to line the baseball diamond <laughs> and the soccer fields. And I would like to suggest, I think we should all find new uses for cow's milk or just stop using it all together. So last story from Navajo, this is Eddie. And Eddie Yassi came to our very first class. Here he's shaking Dr. Barnard's hand, and that's me behind. And Eddie sat in the back of the class every week. He had to be there because he was the AV guy, very important role. And um, he, at the end of the eight weeks, he greeted me at my car. And um, he, he said, Carolyn, I've got to show you something. And he bent over and touched his toes. And he said, I couldn't do that before your class. I would lose my balance, and I'd fall over. But now I can tie my shoes. Well, Eddie went home and told his two young adult children and his wife they were now going to go vegan. And they were not happy about it. Um, but they did. And eight months later, I had called Eddie and I said, we are making a little video. Would you like to be part of it? And he said, yeah. So we were filming an album for Kitty Shows Up, and he's got his son Jensen with him. And he says, Carolyn, I've got a surprise for you. This is Jensen. He's lost 80 pounds. 
And that was now nine years ago. Jensen's kept his weight on. Um, I also have, found, have stayed in contact with the family. I visit them every chance I ca can. And I was really excited when Eddie called me and told me that his daughter, Jamie, was pregnant. And he actually called me from the delivery room. And this is, what he, this is how he said it. Carolyn, we've got the first vegan Navajo baby. And, um, this is Nevaeh. And I got to hold her when she was 11 days old. And I've watched her grow up. Here she is with her grandpa, Eddie. Here she is at two. And she just started kindergarten. So her dad's packing her a plant-based, food for life, vegan lunch every day. I also got another call two years ago that we now have the first vegan Navajo baby boy. And this is Pythagoras, her little brother. So I like to say this is the story of how Native Americans defeated diabetes. And you know, I, I think spending this time sharing this story with you is worthwhile because if we can cure diabetes among the Native people where they have so little resources, they don't have access to good medical care, their access to food, especially in the winter, is really limited, it's really expensive. If they can do it there, oh my gosh, we should be able to do it across the rest of the country, absolutely. So I hope you'll be inspired by the stories of the Native Americans. And we have created a website called nativepowerplate.org, and we have a number of videos and educational materials up there, and a lot featuring Jensen and Jamie and, and other people who I've talked about. So this is the website, nativepowerplate.org. Okay, so how is diabetes usually treated? Um, you're told with the diagnosis that you should eat better or eat well, get some exercise, and um, at diagnosis now, you're told to take a pill, right? You're told metformin, usually. And um, you're told to come back within a couple of months, usually. You have your blood sugars rechecked. And if they're still high, you'll get a second pill or a third pill, or maybe an injectable. If your blood sugar's really high, maybe they'll skip right ahead to the injectable. And that's what I was always taught, is the way diabetes goes. I was taught this is a progressive disease. It's not anybody's fault if you progress to needing insulin. It's just the disease. And I no longer believe that to be true. I mean, not that it's anybody's fault. Um, you know, this is certainly, um, you know, we live in an environment where we're surrounded by the wrong food and healthcare professionals who've been trained to prescribe medication. But I think it's a message of hope that there's something that can be done. So um, pills or injectables. And what that means is that most people with diabetes are taking medication. So this pie chart just um, differentiates out. So about 16% of people are the purple. They're taking no medication at all. 58% um, are taking oral medication pills. 12% um, are taking just insulin. And then 14% are taking insulin and pills together. So most people with diabetes are on some kind of medication. And that was the way I practiced. So I, um, sorry, I'm hitting this. And are you here? Are you bothered by the tap, 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 tap? No? OK, good. Um, so I was a pill pusher. And I really took pride in my practice that our numbers were good. You know, we got blood sugars down. We got A1Cs down. But I used a lot of medication. And you would think that my patients would be really grateful for these great numbers. But you know, I was hearing complaints. Um, I was hearing people were upset about the expense of medications. They were upset about the side effects of medications. And the very worst part was that even people who had good numbers, I would see go on to develop vision loss or heart problems or kidney problems. So good blood sugar numbers doesn't always mean that your other organs are protected. Um, so we used a lot of medication, as I mentioned. And um, one reason for that is I had a large group of friends who worked for the pharmaceutical industry. I mean, they were pharmaceutical reps who befriended me and wanted me to use their products. 
and seem sincerely interested in my well-being and my pers my bubbly personality. And, and you know, it was always fun when they came in the office, but they were there to sell their product. And I finally realized I'm, I'm selling their product when I write these prescriptions. So, you know, I used to think if I gave somebody their first sample of medication or I taught them how to give insulin in the office that it was sort of like charity or community service, that I had this free sample of medication to give them. Well, guess what? It is not in the pharmaceutical company's budget as charity. It's in their marketing budget. And it's a huge amount of money. This was from 2011, but they were spending Sample $6.2 billion on samples. Um, not as a convenience, not as a, a charity at all. So, and then they're spending lots of other money to provide speakers of professional programs that clinicians go to. So, anyway, it's sort of like the curtain open, and I started to realize I don't want to be part of this. Um, this is the sample closet in my office, all the different pills that are available. And then this is the sample refrigerator filled with different kinds of insulin and injectables. So they make it really easy for me to pass these out. And if you heard this expression, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So I didn't have a broccoli rub or a black bean rib rub <laughs> in my waiting room telling me about those foods, but I wish I had. So I have some other concerns about over-reliance on medical over-reliance on medication. And the first is hypoglycemia. So this is, this is the flyer that I saw back in like the, in 1985, I'm dating myself here, my first job out of nursing school was on a unit that specialized in the care of people with diabetes. This is back in the day when fewer, that there were so few people who had diabetes that if, if somebody with diabetes was admitted to the hospital, they all went to one floor. Now, every floor on the hospital has people with diabetes, there's so many of them. But anyway, this was what I learned about the signs and symptoms of low blood sugar. And it was created by one of the pharmaceutical companies, and it's this cute little cartoon of all this, the problems of low blood sugar. And you know, they're cartoony, but really they're, they're serious. You know, so it's shaky, fast heartbeat, sweaty, weakness, feeling anxious, hungry, having a headache, dizzy. And we're taught if somebody's got low sugar, they should get some orange juice or drink a can of regular pop or use a treatment. I mean, use a treat, not a treatment, like jelly beans. You know, that's a good time to have some sugar if your blood sugar's low. But hypoglycemia is a really severe problem. And I'm not talking about low blood sugar if you're not on diabetes medication. You know, if you go too long without eating and you've got hypoglycemia, that's, that's a, another form or an indication of pre-diabetes. It's sort of pre-pre-diabetes. But I'm talking about as a side effect from medication. And in, in 2019, the ADA printed this list in their clinical practice guidelines, and it's the first time that I've seen this. So low blood sugar can cause impaired cognition and physical function, depression, confusion, delirium, loss of consciousness, seizures, coma, falls, motor vehicle accidents, ER visits. People who have a severe low blood sugar where somebody else has to help them treat it are at risk of having a, a severe cardiovascular event within three months. And then they're more likely to die. So, you know, this is not something to take lightly. If somebody's on medication for low blood sugar, we want to make sure they know how to recognize and treat the symptoms and they're always carrying a treatment. Um, but more importantly, we want to consider, is it even appropriate to use those medications? So there's three classes of drugs that cause low blood sugar. They are insulin, sulfonylureas, which include drugs like glimepiride and glucotrol and glymase and then the maglitonides, which are Prandin and Starlux. So these are drugs to be really careful with. And as, as I'll talk about, when somebody changes their diet, if they're on any of these medications, these are the first we want to cut back on, you know, with help from your healthcare professional. So other reasons besides low blood sugar to be worried about over-reliance on medication is polypharmacy. So that's a big word for too many drugs. And the problem with taking a lot of drugs is anybody, 
who's on five or more drugs is at a high risk of interaction of those medications. Well, most people with diabetes are on six or more, and most el and 30% of elderly patients take six or more medications. So I think we have to really always be asking, you know, is this drug still necessary? What can I do to get off it? And then the last concern I'll mention is the cost. And this slide's a little outdated. The price of the insulin has gone up 300% in the last 12 years. 300%. A month's supply of insulin, which some people it lasts a month, some people it's two or three weeks, some people might get six or seven weeks, um, but a box of insulin pens can be four to six hundred dollars. And that doesn't include the pen needles that you need to inject the insulin. So, and there's no generic insulin. The, these companies have a lock on the patent and they just keep tweaking it so that it will never become generic. So, Here's a light in the forest. Um, there's an organization in Canada, it's not in the US, of course, um, called deprescribing.org. And they have developed some, they've recognized the risk of hypoglycemia in people with diabetes on these medications. So they have developed patient and clinician education resources. And you can access these at deprescribing.org. And they also have resources for people who are on antipsychotics or um, benzodiazepines like um, Valium or proton pump inhibitors like Omeprazole or Nexium. Those are also really problematic drugs. Um, so but one thing I'll say about deep prescribing is they only have information about older patients and drugs that cause low blood sugar. They haven't developed information yet for all the other drugs for diabetes. How do we help people get off of them? What are the problems around them? So that's the piece that I'm working on with others because we see lots of opportunity to get people off their medications. Less farm, more farm. So there are now 12 classes of medications and I've listed them for you here. Um, I used to joke that this was my job security in the medical practice I worked with because the doctors I work with, you know, they were generalists. They weren't specialists in diabetes. And, you know, one of them used to say, I wouldn't know how to spell such and such if it wasn't for you because, you know, I was writing the prescriptions for these drugs. Um, but so, so there's a lot of choices. So some of you may feel pressure from your healthcare professional to start on a medication because, you know, we've got so many choices. Um, but I want to encourage you to step back and, and avoid it if possible. So this is a very busy slide, and I know you can't read it from the back. I just want you to get a sense of it. This is an algorithm, which is sort of like a roadmap or a recipe for clinicians of how to use diabetes medications. And this is it's published every year. It's updated every year by the American Diabetes Association. So at the top, it says when somebody's first diagnosed, tell them to change their lifestyle and to take metformin. And then it says, you know, is their blood sugar still high? Well, then they should go on any of these groups of medications. Or do they also have heart disease or kidney disease? Well, then we can use these medications. So it's this very busy, and I've watched it evolve over the years. I mean, it, it's gone from three rows to all these different boxes and all these different colors. And what's the purpose of all these medications? Well, it's to get to the holy grail of diabetes management. An A1C, which is a blood test of, that measures diabetes control, and the magic number is an A1C below six. Well, I'm hearing different numbers. And the ADA says um, below 7% is considered, they consider it good control. Now, I'm gonna suggest that target should totally be individualized. Um, some people should be higher, some people might even be lower. But they are saying, you know, that's why we give all these medications to get people in control, and they define it as below seven. So I would suggest that this is getting people to look good on paper. And by that, I want to give you an example. This is Debbie. She's a nurse, and she's pictured here at age 41 in 1997. She had gestational diabetes that went away after the delivery, and then um, she developed diabetes 11 years later, and she weighed 252 pounds. Her BMI was 40.6. Goal is around 25 or lower. She wore extra, extra, extra large scrubs to work. Her A1C was 
slightly elevated at 7.5, and her doctor put her on uh, metformin and an older pill, a common pill at the time, Diabeta. So Debbie made some effort to change her diet and get healthier, and she lost about 50 pounds, and her BMI came down to 34, and her cholesterol was still high, but a lot better, and she had dropped a size in her scrub. She was down to extra, extra large. Um, she was on four medications, uh, an injectable called Victoza, metformin. She was on a blood pressure pill and a cholesterol pill. She was sick to her stomach all the time, and she was pretty sure it was from one of the medications, but you know, her doctor told her that she was doing great. She had an A1C of 6.6%, you know, below, below the target. So that was in 2013. She was still frustrated with her, her weight, and here she's pictured with her first grandbaby. So this is a more recent picture of Debbie. This was in 2017. And here she's off all of her medications. She um, went off of all of them, um, off all medications for two years. After, oh, and it was two years in 2017. After just two months on a plant-based diet, her A1C was 5.5 at this time. It now stays in the normal range. Um, her weight is a nice trim, 138. Her BMI is 22. She is wearing size small scrubs for the first time in her career. And in 2018, her doctor told her, you no longer have diabetes. I'm taking it out of your medical record. So great example. Yeah, I'll call her. So great example of looking good on paper. You know, good blood pressure, good numbers, but feeling crummy, knowing there was something more. And she's a nurse like me. So, you know, we feel like we should know this stuff. But unfortunately, it's not all, it wasn't taught in school. It is starting to be taught in school, um, but we're not at all schools yet. So this is Debbie now, and here she is with her most recent grandchild, and she's holding this baby in Australia. She now feels good enough to get on a plane and make that journey. Okay, so I wanna show you a couple quick videos. Um, so first of all, um, you've all heard these ads ask Ask your doctor. So let me just show you a, an ad you may have seen. Help control cravings and lose weight with Contrave. It's FDA approved to help adults who are overweight or struggle with obesity lose weight and keep it off. Contrave is believed to work on two areas of the brain your hunger center. I'm so hungry. And <laughs> ice cream. French fries. To help control cravings. One ingredient in Contrave may increase suicidal thoughts or actions. Seeds, only because they're really high in calories, but they're, they have lots of health benefits, so a handful a day. 
And then vitamin B12 is really important for anybody following a plant-based diet, but especially people who have diabetes who are already at risk of nerve damage. And if you're B12 deficient, you're also at risk of nerve damage. So um, B12 is safe. We encourage everybody to take a supplement. Um, so I can tell you more about that if you want to know more. All right, so very quickly, I'm going to zip through some research studies, and then we're going to talk about um, how, to, how to do this. So the Adventists are a religious group that, um, by religious tenet, follow a healthy lifestyle. They don't drink. They don't, um, they don't drink alcohol. They don't smoke, they exercise, and they're encouraged not to eat meat. Well, about 50% follow that. Um, some eat, some do everything, but they still include animal products. So this chart just shows the different stripes of Adventists uh, and, how, and their weight compared to how much meat they eat. So the blue bar, the lowest body mass index, 23.6, are the vegan group. So they're not eating any animal products. And then as we move this direction, the lacto-ovo-vegetarian, those are people who eat a little bit of milk is lacto and ovo is eggs. They have a slightly higher BMI. And then the pesco-vegetarian is an occasional piece of fish. They're, they're now in the overweight category. The semi-vegetarian once a week might have some animal product. And then the non-vegetarian is more than once a week. Um, and they have the highest body mass index. So look at this chart. This is rates of diabetes. So without even having to read the fine print, you can see they're almost identical. The more animal products that are consumed, the higher the rate of diabetes. Um, this was a study, and I'm, I know it's hard to read this the bad. I'm just going to tell you what this is really a reminder to me. So in um, 2006, the Physicians Committee did a study that was funded by our tax dollars, um, conducted uh, whoops, with the National Institutes of Health and George Washington University and University of Toronto. And they, they were looking at people who already had diabetes to see what, a, what difference this diet would make. And they followed people over 22 weeks um, who were either on a plant-based diet or they were eating the conventional diet for diabetes, so a portion control diet. They were told to limit the amount of carbohydrates they were eating. Well, both groups lost weight, and both groups got better numbers. But the people in the plant-based group lost twice as much weight, and their hemoglobin A1c dropped three times as much. Um, their cholesterol dropped more. They were able to reduce medication by twice as much. So they did really well. This study was published in 2006, and then starting in 2009, the American Diabetes Association has included this study in their clinical practice guidelines every year. So I want to tell you, your healthcare professionals, doctors, nurse practitioners, should be offering a plant-based diet as an option. It's within the guidelines because of this study. Another study showed that a plant-based diet was just as acceptable to people over a period of weeks or months as any other diet. You know, it takes a little learning curve to, to try it out, to get used to it, to figure out what to eat. Um, but the study showed that this can be totally acceptable. And now we have a number of different organizations that are including a plant-based diet in their guidelines. Um, this picture shows the underlying mechanism, and it's kind of busy, but I just want to talk you through what's really happening. You know, why does a Plant, a whole food plant-based diet work for diabetes. When you think about it, when people are eating these starchy meals, you know, potatoes, rice, um, whole wheat bread, um, all oatmeal, you know, these are all starches, carbohydrates, right? Why aren't they making blood sugars go up? Well, let's talk about what's happening at the cellular level. So if I were to, so, and this is, this was developed by Dr. Barnard, and if you've heard him talk, I, I will, do, I will go through this exactly the way he does because he does it so well. So he says, if I were to take a needle and stick it in my leg and pull out one muscle cell and blow it up, this is that blue circle, that's your muscle cell. And your muscle cells need sugar or glucose for fuel. So when you eat, the body breaks down the glucose and it becomes these little red dots. And those red dots have to get into the muscle cell. And they have to go through these little doors on the muscle cell wall. Those are those little purple things. Well, in order for those doors to open, that's where insulin's involved. 
So when we start thinking about insulin, our pancreas spits out these little insulin keys up here, these little bow ties. And they connect with insulin receptors on the muscle cell wall. And those receptors signal the glucose receptors to, op to open. So that's normal metabolism. That's what's supposed to happen. So the muscle cells pull the sugar out of the bloodstream where it could cause problems and into the muscle cells where it can get burned up for fuel. Well, in people who have type 2 diabetes, newer technology, CAT scans, PET scans, have allowed scientists to look inside the muscle cells. And what they have found is fat. They have found people who have type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance have these muscle cells that are clogged up with fat. And that fat interferes with the insulin signaling. Now, where does this fat come from? Well, it might be from steak. It might be from chicken. It might be from fish. Yes, even fish. Even the fish with their omega-3 fatty acids that are supposed to be so healthy for us. Well, where do the fish get their omega-3 fatty acids from? Anybody know? Algae. From algae, from eating plants, right, in, in the water. So as Dr. Michael Greger likes to say, let's cut out the middle fish and just get, eat the plants or walnuts or flax seeds or other good sources of omega-3s. And, and those foods, you know, fish also have saturated fat, cholesterol. Cheese is another source of dietary fat. Corn oil, olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, extra, extra virgin olive oil, it doesn't matter. If you have the genetic predisposition for diabetes, you're at risk of your muscle cells storing fat. Now the good news is that if you get the fat out of your diet, eliminate these animal foods, eliminate or greatly reduce the oil, you can turn this around. And that's why we talk about reversing diabetes, because the body's ability to use, to, to burn those carbohydrates gets better when we get the fat out of the muscle cells. Okay, so that is your takeaway message today. Is it about carbs? No. And, and I'm not suggesting that there aren't some bad carbs. I mean, we don't need sugar. Um, we don't need white flour. Um, but the, we can digest those foods, and more importantly, we can digest the healthy carbohydrates, the sweet potatoes and the apples and the delicious pastas and whole wheat bread. We can and potatoes, we can enjoy all of those things when we get the fat out of the muscle cells. So um, animal foods are high in, higher in fat. Um, vegetables all have a little bit of fat, but very small amounts, not enough that it's problematic, but enough to meet your needs. Now, you could do this by not eating fat. You could also do it by having metabolic surgery, bariatric surgery. And what this surgery does is it bypasses the stomach, makes the stomach smaller, and reduces absorption of fat from, from the intestinal tract. But this is an expensive procedure. It's really not what we want to see most people doing, and it's got some serious side effects. So which people live the longest? You know, if you want more evidence for the benefits of a plant-based diet, um, a few years ago, a team of researchers from National Geographic were given an assignment to go around the planet and find the people who live the longest. And they found them in Sardinia, Italy, in um, Loma Linda, California, and in um, um, Okinawa. Okinawa, thank you, Japan. And they wrote a book called The Blue Zones. They called it The Blue Zones because they had a map in their office. And every time they found one of these places where people were living to be 90 and 100 without chronic disease, they circled that place with a blue magic marker. So it's a great book. Um, and here's somebody in Okinawa. What do you think the people of Okinawa eat? where they're surrounded by water. You think fish, maybe you think rice, because it's Japan, but here's a chart showing what they eat, and I heard it right here. Oops, sorry about that. Sweet potatoes, 70% of their diet in Okinawa is sweet potatoes. But isn't that a carbohydrate that would raise blood sugar? Okay. No, okay, the message here is dietary fat is the problem. It's not about the carb. So in 2016, the um, World Health Organization called it the International Year of Pulses, and pulses is another word for beans. And you know, we've all heard we should eat more fruits and vegetables, but I'm here to tell you we should eat more beans. And that is one of the best things you can do for yourself if you have diabetes. This is a sign I saw on the Navajo Nation, food is medicine. This is a picture of a Navajo elder woman, and this is exactly the treatment. You know, we're taught in school that type 2 diabetes, high blood sugar, 
is a problem of all these different organs. It's your pancreas not making enough insulin. It's your liver pumping out sugar when you don't need it. It's your muscle cells that are resistant to insulin. Well, I think it's not all of these organs. They may be involved. And of course, why do we need to know about all these organs? Because drugs target these different organs, right? But the primary organ in your body that controls your blood sugar is this one. <laughs> so, that, so this is something that we can control. And the, the first part about it is education. So I appreciate you, all of you being here today. Just very quickly, we are eating so much more meat than we ever used to. In, two, in 1909, it was about 123 pounds per person per year. Um, now in 2012, 181 pounds per person per year. That's all kinds of meat. Chicken, we've gone from about 10 pounds per person to about 56 pounds per person per year. We kill a million chickens per hour in the U.S. Cheese is another food. Look at how much more we're eating. It used to be about uh, four pounds per person per year. Um, and now, in 1960, Domino's came out with pizza. In 2012, we're up to 33 and a half pounds per person per year. So that's where we're getting all these fat calories. So, um, you know, what should, if you're going to focus on a number in diabetes, what number should you focus on? You know, it's fine to shoot for a low A1C if you're doing it with lifestyle. Absolutely. Safe, worth the effort. But I'm going to suggest another number to you today, and that is not hemoglobin A1C, it's fiber. And I want you to look and start looking at labels and seeing how much fiber you're eating in a day. Because this is where we really have a deficiency. We do not have Americans suffering from protein deficiency, but everybody's worried about getting enough protein. You don't go to the hospital because you're visiting your friend who's got protein deficiency, right? And this just doesn't happen. What we have is a fiber deficiency. That's why you go into any grocery store or drugstore and you will see a shelf of laxatives available. We are not eating enough fiber. You know, fiber helps to regulate blood sugar. Where is fiber? It's only in plants. Your skinless chicken breast has no fiber in it. Your um, lean beef or even your full fat beef has no fiber. So where are you gonna get your fiber from all these different plants? And 40 grams a day is a great number to shoot for. Um, work up to that. Um, most Americans get about 10 or 15 grams a day. And um, if you start high fiber and you haven't been doing it, you will not be very happy with me, and I don't wanna hear any complaints. So drink a lot of water along with it. Small servings of beans to start with, not a whole can of baked beans. But if the beans bother you, that is your body telling you, you have not been eating enough beans, okay? Because your system will adjust, but give it time. Okay, so my number concern, number one concern is number two. <laughs> All right, so you have three opportunities every day to reverse diabetes. Anybody know what they are? Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, A plus. And I want to encourage you to eat foods on the power plate, fruits, vegetables, whole beans, and grains. What can you expect? Well, some people will see results immediately. And I have found sometimes I have to cut people's insulin in half um, or take them off of some medications right away. A small number will see blood sugars go up initially. And I encourage you to work with your healthcare professional. But in general, for patients who, if I have their chart, I will usually encourage them to watch it over time and to stay in touch with me but I'm not too worried about a few days or even a few weeks of high blood sugars. Um, I want to give time for the diet to work. Um, I encourage you to be patient because it may take some time, weeks, months. I had one guy at one of my classes, his wife said it took him a year and a half, but he got off all of his medications. Um, if you want to speed things up, you can also exercise and make sure you're getting enough sleep. And then follow up with your healthcare professional for medication monitoring. So just a few special considerations. Um, we talked about high blood sugar. Blood sugar can go up. Blood sugar can drop very suddenly, so work with your healthcare professional to go down a medication. Blood pressure medications all of a sudden can become too strong. So if you're on blood pressure medication and you notice you're feeling 
lightheaded when you get up out of a chair. You know, that's a sign that you're getting too, you may be getting too much blood pressure medication. So I'm not telling anybody to stop their medication. I want you to work with your healthcare professional, but I want you to be safe. And then lastly, if you're on um, Coumadin, um, Warfarin, a, a blood thinner, um, these medications interact with vitamin K, so if you've been eating no greens at all and you start eating a lot of greens, your proton, your INR may change, so you may need to have your blood tested more often than once a month. So again, work with your healthcare professional, but greens are really important for everyone. And then finally, I mentioned vitamin B12. So I want to leave you with some resources, and I will invite you to snap some pictures because we're trying to limit paper that we're using here. Um, so first of all, if you have not seen these movies, how many have seen um, Forks Over Knives? Oh, most of you. Okay, great. Another great one that um, stars many people here from, from Michigan is Eating You Alive. Um, they're both on Netflix. Okay, another great movie. Who saw The Game Changers last Monday? Yay! So I looked it up, and it's coming to iTunes October 1st. Um, also, please check out the position committee's website, and if you put in physicianscommittee.org slash diabetes, you'll see a number of resources that I have carefully curated for you, and we put new stuff there all the time, so that's a great resource for you and for your healthcare professional who wants to learn more. Um, we've got two great apps for the phone, or two, uh, I'm sorry, we have a great resource that's available as an app or a website. It's called um, 21 Day Vegan Kickstart. Um, if you just download dial in 21 day kickstart. Um, it's 21 days of meal plans, grocery lists, recipe, recipes, celebrity videos. It's a great way to try out plant-based eating. And then a wonderful conference, and I want to encourage all of you to mark your calendars, May 29th, May 30th, right, through June, are those the right dates, Sherry? Yes, I've got Jen, okay. May 30th through June 1st in Ypsilanti is the PPAD conference, which stands for Plant-Based Prevention of Disease, and it's going to be two and a half days um, of wonderful, world-renowned speakers. They're authors. They've been on TV. They're, I mean, they're amazing speakers at an incredibly reasonable price. You can come for a day. You can come for the full two and a half days. Encourage your healthcare professionals to be there. It's PPAD.org or, or PreventionOfDisease.org. And um, I hope you'll come, and all the food is delicious and plant-based. We'll be serving meals included in your price. And then the last thing is, now that you don't need your medications, what are you going to do with them? Well, please don't flush them down the toilet or the drain. They, um, I, I used to tell people to Google drug disposal, take that, but I just heard on the radio yesterday that um, Meyer and CVS, and I think Walgreens, any, if they have a pharmacy, if they have a 24 hour ph pharmacy at the drugstore, they will all take back medications that you are not using. Metformin is showing up in the Great Lakes. It's not being filtered out of our water supply. It's the most widely prescribed drug for diabetes, and it's in our water. And it's causing endocrine issues, reproductive issues among minnows. Now, those are the animals that have been studied. So I don't know how it's affecting other animals. But the bottom line is we got to get off these drugs and we have to help other people get off these drugs. So um, I want to thank everybody who was, who I, whose picture was shared um, here. And my prescription for all of you is to eat lots of beans, greens, and grains. Thank you. I will be hanging out at the Peapod booth. I will be at the Peapod table, which is back by the kids, um, where the kids are doing artwork. If you walk to the back of the, the um, floor, you'll find me there. We've got some handouts. You're welcome to take pictures of these things if you don't want the papers. Um, they're here, and they're also at the Peapod table. So that's it for our lectures. Thank you. And of course, on behalf of Plant Based Foods, SJA Solutions, Bridge Street Market, Wendy Jones and her team. Have a nice day. We're here till 4 o'clock. Tell a friend about uh, being a vegan or a vegetarian. It's good for us. Thank you very much. Enjoy your time.
Dutch monsters, all the good cases you want to taste of the day. Thank you. 